This is David Giesel. This is Patriots Lament podcast number 001. Maybe we need four zeros or five zeros in front of that because we're going to do tens of thousands of these. Probably. You can hear uh, Josh on the other side here. You want to introduce yourself, Josh? Yeah, I'm Josh Bennett in the glorious Fairbanks, Alaska. Excited to get this thing rolling. I think you're right. Probably tens of thousands if, if mankind is blessed enough to be around that long (laughs) yeah yeah we might have like two or three (laughs) listeners by the 10,000th episode too well there's always a goal yeah there's always a goal if you don't have anything to look forward to you're really wasting your time with whatever endeavor you're doing that's right global domination (laughs) without force is our goal here uh so well three listeners to global domination works for me actually yeah absolutely i like to i like to jump yeah (laughs) <laughs> that mushy middle is no place for anybody. No. So you boring. sent me a Tom Woods podcast, a Tom Woods podcast yeah. today, and uh, I listened to it and have some thoughts on it. Do you want to uh, summarize it for our our listeners here? I'll pull up the number of the podcast. You can give them the gist of it. Um, it was just, uh, I believe, Paul Godfrey. Yeah, it was. It was episode eleven sixty four. Okay, so 1164, the Tom Woods podcast, which is, uh, I listen to probably all of them eventually, but not necessarily as they come out every day. Some I have great interest in, some are just, just like anything, not as interesting. But this one I caught my eye, because he's talking about the cultural Marxist, and found it kind of interesting that's why i sent to you because it seemed he started off saying there's no such thing as the cultural marxist and at the same time used the phrase several times so i thought that was interesting for one but uh, just the whole you know the the marxist (laughs) i thought it was interesting the way he was talking about the old marxist you know the 50s versus today's marxist 2018 marxist in the the differences between them and, you know, whether, um, you know, the sexual revolution type of things or the uh, transgender things are really a, a Marxist revolution culturally or what. And I kind of took away a little bit of bolt where he said, you know, one, the 50s Marxists could care less. But I kind of took away, I don't remember if he said it per se, Without that Marxism, you wouldn't have had today's, um, you wouldn't have 2018 sexual talks or the uh, transgender talks that we have now without that cultural Marxism, or not, without the Marxism of the old, you wouldn't have what we call cultural Marxism today. What do you think? Yeah, well. And, and the reason that it caught my eye was the, the whole Peterson thing. Right, because he talks a lot about the cultural Marxist. He does. He does. Why don't we back up and define these terms quickly for the listeners out there? So, a, I'll give it a whack, and you can jump in with corrections as at the end here, Josh. <laughs> so, uh, well, you'll have you'll have a more nuanced view of this. So, you know, a regular, a classical Marxist is someone who read Marx. And um, maybe, you know, they certainly read the Communist Manifesto. They may have read Das Kapital, um, probably not in German, but if they were ballers, they read it in German. And they believe in his, you know, he was kind of an economist, but really more kind of a philosopher, but really more of a propagandist, I guess you could say. Maybe all philosophy is a little bit propaganda. Um, Sure. So... They, a sure. classical Marxist, believes that society should be built upon the tenets of Marx, but they believe this in a, let's say, a, uh, a mechanical and administrative way, okay? So it's the idea that you take, you implement Marx's plan in the administration of the state, and then you create a Marxist state. Does that, does that sound correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so then a call... And you know, yep. I just... just uh... Let's also, when you're in here, um, because the particular Tom Woods podcast we're talking about with Gottfried was, um, he stressed a lot about the Frankfurt School, or Frankfurt School, however they say it. Indeed. 
Which is funny. You know what? <laughs> I know this is totally off the board here. I kept in my I I heard him saying Frankfurt, and in my mind I kept going back. My brain was translating to Chicago. Oh, Chicago school. <laughs> Isn't that? I don't know why. I mean, I I had to literally think to me. Wait a minute! No, they said Frankfurt School, not Chicago School. <laughs> Why my brain was having a hard time differentiating the two was kind of fun to think about later. Yeah, indeed, right? That's a that's a topic for the end for sure. So, <laughs> so yeah, a Marxist, a classical Marxist or whatever, you know, is this person who believes that Marxist plan should be implemented administratively, um, and a cultural Marxist, a cultural Marxist is. A individual who believes that Marxism should be implemented through cultural revolution. So instead of using the state, or let's say in conjunction with the state, um, they also advocate that the culture shift to reflect the virtues or values that can only be realized under a Marxist regime. So it's kind of um, it's kind of you could start with the process and then get the outcome, or you could create the outcome and then if people find the outcome desirable, they'll implement the process. Is that does that sound right? Yeah, but it, um, yeah, it does. But in practicality, I think the cultural Marxists lean heavily on the state to implement their cultural their culture. I agree. I agree. I mean the. Uh, the recent thing there in Canada with, uh, you know, the the pronouns or however the, the gender speak, I guess is the easiest way. They're not they're not totally relying on changing the culture through maybe what we'd say hearts and minds. Right, right. We could look at the laws and say you could say that that's a cultural law, right? They haven't. You could say that's sure. a cultural law, and that's where Peterson actually had an issue. He said this is not just a cultural law. This is this is right at the core. It's not a periphery thing. So let's let's summarize, and you can rip the summary apart, but we could summarize maybe by saying a, a classical Marxist believes in getting the big stuff done first, and a cultural Marxist believes in starting at the edge and doing incrementalism. Grassroots. Grassroots, with... Absolutely, like you said, uh, state involvement, but what they would view as incremental state involvement. You don't start with the revolution, you finish with it. Right, right. That makes sense. Okay, so... so, I think that's a good summary of it. Okay, super, super. Let's roll with that um, so the listeners know that. So, So, onward, so you summarize this podcast by talking about the... The cultural Marxists and the classical Marxists, and how the the cultural Marxists are inspired by, but not doing the same things as the classical Marxists, right? Right. Yeah. And what was Tom Wood's big? So you identified something. He started by saying that that there really are no cultural Marxists, right? Such a term doesn't right. exist. And yet he used it. And I think that was Gottfried. Oh, Gottfried. Okay, right. Gottfried said it doesn't yeah. exist. Right. And uh, but they both used the term, which is funny. So over and over. Yeah. What over did you over. have any particular things that you wondered about my thoughts on it, or just in general? Um, kind of in general. One of the things was, you know, the striking of, yeah, this isn't really a thing. It's not really a term. Then why are you using it? I mean, because you're, you're using the, you know, I love what you did right at the beginning here when you said we're going to define our terms. And defining our terms, we define our speech. So when we define our speech and we say something doesn't exist, why do we use it? Because <laughs> automatically we're letting someone else define the terms and define the speech. Yeah, there's a, there's a word for that as well, which Peterson and Hans Hoppe both use. And it's called a performative contradiction. Compar- right and and it's oh Peterson yeah Peterson, Peterson started is, uh, he's used that a few times he doesn't use it often because it's a confusing term but we'll define that really quick too a performative contradiction is a contradiction that you make when you perform the action of living so if you said uh, water is poison 
and then you drink a glass of water um, and you don't die, that's a performative contradiction. You're saying something's poison and that drinking it will kill you and then you drink it and live. Right. right. So, or you could, you could correct that behavior, but if you said no one should drink water because it's poison, and then you drink a glass of water, that's a performative contradiction. Your actions contradict, the actions you perform contradict with what your stated belief was. Let's say for a fun um, example, the prohibition in the United States where the government said that in, in one area, they said that uh, having an alcoholic beverage was bad for society and thou shalt not have. So they made it against the law, threw people in prison and extolled the virtues of themselves while they drank the best fine liquors that America had. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The state. Uh, let's say the individuals who make up the administration of the state are often very skilled that performative contradiction. Excellent. Because yes. um, the state doesn't exist. Only, only people exist. So, yeah. So what did I think about it? Okay. Um, I thought it was... In, okay, the first thing that I thought was interesting about it was Tom Woods was concerned about it even though he admitted that it hasn't affected his life. Does that make sense? Hmm. He said, this, this bothers me as a, as a you know, business owner, even though I don't employ anyone. I work with independent contractors, and so I'm not bound by any of these laws. And actually, yep, none, of, none of the laws have really been passed. You know, no, no laws that really affect me have been passed yet, um, and so on and so forth. And so he said, you know, essentially, this really doesn't affect me yet, but I'm concerned about it. And I could see that I could see that both ways, right? He's concerned about the future, but at the same time, what's you know, what's he really worried about? So that that jumped right. out at me. And then um, as they got into it, I wasn't exactly sure. I wasn't exactly sure why um, why Gottfried said that cultural Marxism is a contradiction in terms. I, you know, he identified he identified that the the groups of people that make up the current cultural Marxist movement are often at odds with each other in terms right. of Marx's ideals, but they're allied with each other in terms of saying that they're cultural Marxists. I I think he's I don't know. There's a tendency of people who have read too much history to say. Well, this isn't the real thing, right? This is the fake movement. Um, like, what is a Nazi today, okay? You know, is a Nazi right. some skinhead kid who wears a swastika? Like, you know, American History X, you know, Edward Norton in that movie? Is that a, is that a real Nazi? Like, I would say that's not a real Nazi. But a lot of people say, well, today that's what a Nazi is. You know, they right. may be right. So, anyway. Yeah. yeah Wanna be? Right. I mean, you could say that. You could say there's a bunch of different ways to look at it. So I got his point there. So to summarize his point, his point was that real Marxists focus on, let's say, the class struggle, okay, and the meat. They focus on economic Marxism, the battle against capitalism, which they view from Marxist standpoint, capitalism is an irrational economic system. Right. Um, and uh, so Marx said, Marx said that capitalism was crazy because it couldn't work, which is the same thing that Mises said about socialism, right? Which is sort of funny. Um, so a classical One's Marxist... One's been proven, right? A, yeah, yeah. Well, that experiment's played out now. So a classical <laughs> Marxist starts with the meat. Let's implement the economic plan and, and put the proletariat, the working class, back in charge and overthrow the bourgeois the ruling class or the ownership class and then all these wonderful things will come of it and um and so they unite based on class and what he what he was pointing out about the cultural marxists today is you have you have groups like you'll have uh black americans okay who are generally low income right that's one of their beefs okay right and they certainly get an interesting treatment from the police in general right not you know 
yeah, certainly in the news it's portrayed that way. Let's say that. Right. Um, and then they're allied with white feminists, or let's just say feminists, who are mostly white upper class women, right? So these women get they're the highest admission rate into universities. Um, they get the most scholarships because they they have super high academic achievement and they're women. Um, they have high paying occupations. You know, they're, they're, they get PhDs and master's degrees and they go into the medical field and things like this. Um, you know, they make less than white men. You, you could say, you can look at that a bunch of different ways, but they make more than just about everybody else. Right. Right. And they're allied with black Americans who make white men. Let's clarify white men in their specific field. Uh, yes, yes, Ma- make make more, or or whatever. Yeah, for the comparison. So anyway, these two these two groups that make up or, or that are part of cultural Marxism, white feminist, you know, upper class women, and uh, black Americans, are economically um, at odds with each other. One of them is the bourgeois, and one of them is the proletariat. You know, there's a ruling class, right? Right. But in cultural Marxism. They're both victims of the patriarchy, the white patriarchy. And so they're united, not in economic class, but in oppression class. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that leads me to ask you a question that might be a little needed for discussion is how important is the economic portion of this? Because let's say the Nazi, you know, we were talking about this uh, Nazi punk today. Is he a real Nazi or whatever? I would say that there's a 99.9% chance that he has no idea what the fascist model of the economy is, a fascist economy is. Um, And just like what we're talking about with the social Marxists, it's almost like they're just socialists that have other agendas. But they, you know, economic wise, do they understand anything about Karl Marx, Marxism? economics of communism okay um or how about a libertarian right they're libertarians but then they they uh, they're also involved in saving the planet or this and that and blah, blah blah so they're cultural libertarians yeah how much how much does does the economic side of it really have to do with any sure across the spectrum okay check this mm-hmm. out check this out i really like that um how many how many Germans in the 1930s would you say were Nazis? I don't know. Probably less than a majority. How many would you say understood what Nazism meant? More than less than that majority. Less than the majority of the majority that were that were Nazis. Okay. Probably none. Right. Like okay. The, so then, what is the, the difference between a skinhead kid with a swastika tattooed on his chest and a German living in the 1930s in terms of their in terms of their belief system? Right. We could call the kid a farce because he doesn't understand the system. Right. But most right. of the people living in the system probably didn't understand it either. Uh, yeah, no, that's probably true. But they were, I think they were more just living their day-to-day life like we do in corporate America. Sure, in USA. Yeah, they just, okay, I understand that. Right, they weren't advocating for the cause, and the kid is, and that's what makes him a phony. Right. Okay, so, so same question with a cultural Marxist. How many of them have read Marx? Like, have they even read the Communist Manifesto? This is a funny question, okay? I have asked people um, who I guess I, I don't know if they would call themselves cultural Marxists, but let's say they identify with the majority of the viewpoints. Let's say they, they identify with most of the viewpoints advocated by the so-called cultural Marxist. I have asked them before, a few specific people, if they've read the Communist Manifesto. And the normal reaction that I've, let's say the most common reaction I've gotten, it has been, 
a reaction that treats that question as if it's bait, as if it's a baiting question. Mm. And I found that very interesting. You know, you find somebody who's advocating for, um, oh, I don't know, uh, let's say, you know, a a 95% estate tax or something like this, right? And right. they say they say, well, yeah, the money should be redistributed to uh, to the poor, and or you you know, and they're advocating for um, uh, the inclusion of all of these um, victim groups, you know, for special consideration in government programs and stuff like that. And you ask them, you say, okay, I'm trying to understand your position better. Um, have you read the Communist Manifesto? they think that you're setting a trap for them with that question, right? Mm. That's, the, that's the general reaction I've gotten. And, uh, and that's sort of fair because usually when I ask somebody a question, I am setting a trap for them. Um, <laughs> but in this case, this would be like you ask a Christian, okay, let's say you don't believe in God and you have a Christian neighbor and you go over there and you say, hey, I'm trying to understand your Christian thing. Um, have you actually read the Bible? Right. I mean, if the believer in this case really believes and has, you know, if they really believe, they're going to say yes, because that's like something you do if you really believe, usually. And they're not going to be embarrassed. They're going to be like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course I've read the Bible. What would you like to know? And the guy could say, well, how do you believe all that crazy stuff that's in there? And he, right. you know, and he could say, well, like, give me an example. Let's talk about it. Um, I've never, when I've asked people, have they read the Communist Manifesto? No one has ever said, yeah. Yeah, what are the points in there that are confusing to you or that you would like to discuss? Hmm. I've never gotten that response. So I agree. I was thinking of, while you were talking about this, my example that came to my head was um, the libertarian uh, Austrian, right? Have you read um, Human Action? Or have you finished Human Action is the better question. And you automatically, you're not going to think of it as a setup. You'd automatically just say, yes, of course, let's get into it. Or if you haven't, you're not going to pretend you had because then you look like an idiot when the questions start coming. Yeah, yeah. Or you could, but, that, but, you're, but you're not going to look at it as a setup. It's not a setup. Human action? Yeah. Right. I've, never had, I've never had somebody who's offended with my, with my uh, white patriarchal capitalist views, which is funny because... I'm, I don't really identify with an economic system as part of my self identity, but you know, whatever. Right. Um, if they want to use slanderous, slanderous economic pronouns to address me, I'm not going to seek a law to change that. So, um, anyway, I've never had anybody say, it, "Well, like, have you read this Murray Rothbard guy? Like, he's you know, he's insane. He has a case of the bat shits." Um, you know, never, never run into right. that. Or, you know, occasionally you run into somebody who's like, yeah, you know, Milton Friedman was, was a giant sellout. And then it's like, yeah, let's high five about that. We disagree about everything, right. but we agree about that totally. Um, so it, it is very interesting. It is very interesting. So backing it up, um, are they real Marxists? They haven't read the Communist Manifesto or they think that it's toxic to talk about in public. Are they real Marxists? No. Right. Not really. So why the term cultural Marxism? I believe that this is a historical thing. Um, I can rap on this for like one minute if you want. Yeah. Okay. So in the 1960s and 70s, okay, that was when the Marxist professors really got a foothold. This is where the hippie generation comes from. A bunch of right. kids went to school and learned learned Marxism. And there's all sorts of stuff that came out of this. Like, uh, are you familiar with The Shining Path? No. Okay, so The Shining Path no. was a program to, to Marxify the Andes. So this would be uh, Ecuador, Chile, um, Peru, uh, Colombia, right? Yeah. Um, it was to it was to Marxify the Andes by sending missionaries, right? And it was funded 
through mostly professors at UC Santa Cruz and UC Berkeley, okay? And Berkeley is, of course, where the whole, you know, that's where a bunch of, a bunch of the revolution of the 60s came from. And some of, right. some of it was, you know, positive social change for sure. Um, but in the background, there was this funding of the Shining Path. So what happened with the Shining Path? Well, the Shining Path went from village to village, and they would convert the village from, you know, whatever system it had, uh, which was usually you know, a tribal leader or whatever, to a Marxist system. They would rile everybody up about, you know, overthrowing the man, right? And then uh, they would get the village to become Marxist. Uh, what's, what's brilliant about this is is that these same people trash on Christians for being missionaries today. Anyway, <laughs> so they did this. And then um, after that happened, they said, oh, by the way, uh, Marxism is not compatible with Christianity. And this is a life or death scenario. So you should definitely go and kill all the Christians who don't agree to sign up to this. You, you have That's a good strategy to make sure this works. And so all hmm. the villagers are like, well, awesome. Like, we got white people approval and white people funding for this. Uh, let's lock and load. And so they went and hacked the uh, Christians in the Upper Andes to bits with machetes. And everybody had a really wonderful, peaceful, and loving time doing this. So, mm-hmm. so if you go, if you know any missionaries, or, I mean, if you know anybody who's been in the mountains there... Um, you can learn about the Shining Path either from someone who's lived there and lived through it or from a missionary. Pick your source. Um, you're welcome to just travel there and talk to people because they know about it and they know how awful it was. So, wow. So these professors, I'm going, that's kind of too big of a tangent, but anyway, they were real Marxists. They believed that this needed to be implemented by force from the top down, right? Marxist strategy. Marx said that if in order to build the perfect communist society, you had to first build the communist man, which I actually agree with. I think to build any society, you have to first build the individual who can live in that society, if, right. if you could do such a thing, right? Okay, so so it was essentially, are you, do you remember the term by any means necessary? Does that ring a 90s bell? Yeah. Wasn't that, wasn't that, oh, yeah. yeah. Farrakhan who used that? Was oh. it? It was, or was it, uh, was it Malcolm X? Huh, seems like it was X, but, uh, I can remember, yeah. Fair anyway, kind, re- regardless. Kind of relayed a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's a very strong term, right? It carries with it a, a, a gravity of its own, you know? Right. Like, boy, what is any means necessary? That's like saying all options are on the table, which of course means we're going to nuke your butt if you don't play along. So... Anyway, um, that's essentially how the Shining Path worked, and it sh- and these professors funded it uh, from UC Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz. That's where most of the support came from, and uh, thousands of people were slaughtered. So hmm. these professors taught the kids, okay, and the and these the hippie kids are the ones who gave us. Um, they're the ones who gave us kind of the Gen Xers. And a few of the Gen Yers, and then the yep. early Gen Xers are giving us the Millennials, right? Um, and well, and going back, it's like the early Gen Xers and a little back into into the Baby Boomers, right? The, the late Baby Boomers. Yeah. So anyway, yep. these kids go to school now, and unlike their parents or grandparents, instead of learning about Marx directly, they're learning from professors who were either very young then or in school then. So they're learning from Marx secondhand. And the professors are now teaching them, well, um, as hippies, right? These are the the hippies are the professors now. Um, As hippies, they were more interested in the social aspect of Marxism, right? Like free love and, you know, uh, like whatever, right? All the, the women's rights and all this stuff, okay? And so they're... But they recall it as Marxism. And so when they teach these kids, um, you know, the kids will ask their prof, well, you know, who do you read? And they're like, well, you know, Marx is really good. And then they're like, oh, my professor is a Marxist, so I must be learning Marxism. But they're not. They're learning cultural Marxism, which is let's implement the cultural results of Marxism, but let's not do the machetes first. Right. 
So that's where I think the term comes from. Well, and they're not using the machetes, but they're using, they do want, it seems, the, the path of, and kind of, it might be part of the generation, the millennial generation, the path of least, resist, re, least resistance and immediate results, which is why I think they try to use the state and laws so much. I mean, it's, it's almost like they don't, they're too lazy to have a re- revolution. Well, that's an interesting way to look at it. There, there, are, there are a couple other ways to look at it. Or let's say there's one. So you have a laziness, millennial laziness hypothesis for cultural Marxism. Mm-hmm. Which I like. That, that'd be a fun article. Um, touch, touches <laughs> on so many topics of our day. Uh, <laughs> okay, so there's another, there's potentially another one. And I think Peterson, in my understanding of Peterson... Um, oh, yeah. absolutely Please. believes this. I think Peterson may believe this, okay? Which is that, let's say you have a plan, and you know the plan is pretty weak on its own. Like, you know on merit, it's not going to be super good. It's not going to be very strong or robust. So in order to bolster it, um, in order to kind of, you know, give it like a tripod to stand on so it's more stable, you go for the state, Because you know that it won't stick in the culture on its own, right? This would be like using, you know, you're you're pulling the weeds out of your garden and you're spraying an herbicide in. Like you're taking it on two fronts because you really really want this gone and you're not sure that either route is actually going to work. Right. So um, that could be why they're going for it too. Hypothesis one, they're lazy. I pretty much agree with that. Hypothesis two, or young, you could say young, you know, they have high time preference. Hypothesis right. immediate. Two, immediate gratification, yeah. Uh, number two is um, basically that they don't think it will work. And so they want to make it mandatory or personatory. We don't want to use um, male gender pronouns. They want to make it mandatory or personatory for everyone to comply so that they get mass buy-in because they believe they need critical mass in order for it to work. It won't organically make it. And and they're willing to use not just, you know, simple force, but extreme violence to make it happen. Tell me about extreme violence. And having penalties to follow up with. It. Yeah, run me through run What's me through the, through the violence. Give me give me some of that. Well so you know, you have the penalties of, of uh, a law. And I was just thinking, I don't know exactly what the penalties of the law that was uh, Peterson was against in Canada, but it sounded like you could get a fine and maybe a little bit of this and that. But the it seems like once they have um, the backing of a law or they think the law is kind of going to be implemented in their way, it seems that they're willing to go to extreme violence as in the um, physical violence against other people. You know, the whole, um, this is what really boggles my mind is when they're with the um, the speech thing. They, they don't want to be hampered in any speech. They don't want to be held back in any way. Oh, I'm oppressed, I'm oppressed. But they're the most, seems to me, oppressive people. That we have today. Completely oppressive. And it's almost because I have to oppress you because your thoughts. I mean, it's like thought oppression. Your thoughts might oppress me, so I'm going to preemptively oppress you. And there's no... They get they give away, or they just bypass debate. They bypass rationality. They bypass... They bypass life, I guess. They're just like, well, here it is. This is what it's going to be, and we're going to make you do it. You don't like it. We're going to violently force you to like it, which is, which in that area is a lot like a Marxist because the Marxist revolutions were quite violent. I mean, they produced how many dead people in the 20th century? And that's... Maybe not a big leap to go from the, you know, shout downs at different uh, 
gatherings that so-called conservatives or whatever are happening to, I mean, it may not be much of a leap to go from the shout downs to the actual violence of round them up and send them to the gulags. How yeah. far away is that? Um, I have three thoughts on that and I may is actually a... be able to remember all three of them. Oh, snap. Okay. Thought number one is that are we describing Marxism or statism? Right? Damn. So Peterson likes to talk about it being Marxism, right? And the deaths of the 20th century being Marxism. Well, the United States is responsible for some of those deaths. The United States is an abstraction, okay? Like the dropping of the nuclear bombs. You know, that wasn't Germany or Japan. I don't think that the Japan, the imperialists of Japan, nor even the Nazis of Germany liked Marx at any stretch. Sure. Indeed. Indeed. Now, Peterson talks about Russia and China, which Bill Burr does too. Bill Burr, are you familiar with Bill Burr? Yes. Okay, have you heard his bit on the the, the uh, Genocide Hall of Fame? Uh, I'm sure I have. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, he does this thing. He's like, man, you know, Michael Jordan. Oh, yeah. Michael yeah. Jordan was, yeah. like, the greatest, right? He was, like, the greatest of all time in basketball. You know, he's right at the top of the list in the Basketball Hall of Fame. But, like, then Kobe comes along. You know, maybe Kobe's up there. Um, you know, like, there's a couple contenders. Um, Good. Kobe's stats are a little better, but, you know, Jordan, you know, Jordan just, he was the first, right? Um, but they're both pretty close. And he's like, so like, you know, Holoc- not Holocaust Hall of Fame, um, Genocide Hall of Fame. Like, who's number one? Genocide. Like, everybody knows that Hitler is at the top of the list in the Genocide Hall of Fame, right? Everybody knows that. Right. Um, and then he's like, yeah, you know, and he, he talks he talks about Hitler, you know, being really good at genocide. And then he's like, yeah, so then who's number two on that list? And like, you know, why is it hard to come up with number two? And he actually avoided talking about Mao because I think he wants to tour in China. So, oh. yeah, so he says he starts talking about Stalin and Lenin, right? Right. And he's like, yeah. these guys' stats are off the chain, right? Six million. Like, six million for Hitler. <laughs> like, that shouldn't even be a consolation prize. Weak sauce. Yeah. I mean, that's not, even, that's not even a participation trophy. Right, right. Like, that's, you know, you're going back to the amateurs for that. So... He's like, why are these guys not, nobody remembers them. But their stats were great for genocide. Um, anyway, he has, he has this, uh, that's the bit. He, he's funnier uh, for all sorts of reasons. So I recommend checking out the Bill Burr um, Genocide Hall of Fame bit. Yeah, it's great. Um, but yeah, so, so, uh, so are we talking about Marxism or statism? It's, is P- and is Peterson missing that? Well, is, that, no, I jumped. I jumped ahead. That, that might be way too far ahead. No, so that's great. Is he? Well, is he missing it? So he, well, he, he talks about the virtues of the West, and he, what he says though is, we must have gotten something more right than they did. You know, he says something along those lines, or he, he says we must have gotten something right. But, uh, you know, my listening of that is that we must have done a little better because he still admits that our system is a mess, okay? So he's not saying it's great. He's just saying it worked better. And um, and I don't know. Well, and, but did it? I mean, the I think uh, that might be a little bit uh, short-sighted. I mean, the um, – so the West, let's, let's just take America, which is easier for me to – it's the only real talk country about. anyway. Well, it is. The only indispensable one. So, in America, how far back did we get it right, though? Uh, run I me mean, through we, that. What do you mean it, by that? So, in my mind, we haven't gotten it right for 150 years, since about 1860. Right? But, but we've been able to get along because of this immense wealth in the, I think, the the culture, the so, wealth, and everything that was there, that was so huge for so long, for well, a short period of time, 
but it was so massive, it's taken us longer to spoil it. So, from America's founding to 1860 is 100 years, right? Yeah, yeah. From 1860 today is 160 years. Right. So, so I so the point. Let me articulate the point you're making, and then make a devil's advocate point. Okay. Okay. The point you're making is that immense freedom, and let's say immense, immense agency for the individual for the first 100 years of America allowed it to gain enough inertia. It put enough energy into the idea of the country that even after the energy was removed, when the ability to secede was removed, and it became a state proper instead of a yep. union of states, um, there was enough energy put in before that event that we're still coasting, and we haven't run out of steam yet. Yeah. But we're slowing down. I think I would almost just... Uh... You know, for fun, I'd, I'd maybe even would would talk about the eleven year span that we we've been coasting from then, from the Declaration to the Constitution. Sure. Okay. 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 So you view the whole thing as like that's like an avalanche. You kick off an avalanche just with one loud blast, and yep. then all that energy gets released. Um, but eventually it comes to an end and the only energy you put in, there was all this pent up stored energy in the snow up on the mountain, right? With all gravity pulling it down, but it can't break free. You just need enough energy to break it free for a fraction of a second and boom, all that stuff happens. That's your, that's a, and it's a great analogy because I'm going to expand on it. Okay. What is it? An avalanche has a starting point and then moves, right? Yeah. It covers a pretty broad area at times, you know, some sure. it's confined, but it's still pretty broad. Yeah. So it's kind of like the American experiment. What I'm, what I'm going to call the American experiment. You had the avalanche and it exploded and then it went west. The avalanche traveled west and the back part of the avalanche where it started is done. It's all over. All that goodness or whatever you want to call it, all the pent up energy has been expended. But that energy's traveling. Sure. And as it's traveling, so let's say freedom or uh independence, you know, individualism. How about that? Sure. That individualism spreading west, but immediately it's getting stomped where it started. All the energy's gone in the avalanche, but it's moving forward. So I think we had this period where that it moved forward. Now it's done. Once we got to the end of the West, it's over. Okay. And I think it was it was following right behind them. Like it was over in the eastern seaboard pretty quickly and just kind of traveled across. But while it was traveling, we had this vast amount of wealth and knowledge that was gained and a lot of bad things along the way, which is all thanks to the state. But all that compounded. It was a big energy release. It wasn't just the 11 years or whatever. I just like to say that for well, fun because there's no state for those 11 years. Right. No, so so yeah, I mean the energy was – let's say the energy within humanity was pent up and had been pent up forever. And so this new experiment just needed to be a spark and then all the pent up energy would just go boom and the snow, mm -hmm. the snow would start falling. Um, and in that falling snow or falling ice really – um, you would have a lot of energy and a lot of creativity happen, right? But as soon as the snow mm -hmm. has fallen and the mountain is bare, the mountain becomes stagnant again. Right, but while it's going, it's it's carving a new path in the mountain. True. So, so if that is a good analogy for this, then um, wouldn't it be reasonable to expect that outcome? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> what we need to do, what we need to do, is find another mountain that nobody should be skiing on, and then try to get on top of the avalanche the next time it happens, and see if it rolls over us or if we can stay in front of it. 
Well, they're hard to stay in front of for sure. You, but, know, you know, even even Thomas Thomas Paine talked about it, um, and he was living it. You know, Paine, who kind of was back and forth on on things, especially later in his life, probably went the wrong way, the way I see things. But he even talked about. It. He's like, man, we we there's this time in history right now where we don't got a freaking state. What are we doing? This is weird. I mean, he, you know, he wrote about this. There's several years here where we broke off from the Brits and we got no state governments. We basically have no city governments. Dude. We have nothing. We're just rolling along and society's doing fine. He said, "Dude, <laughs> you know what you're talking about? I mean, I'm sure you do." Oh, okay, me. so check it out. Check this out. So, you go from the big American experiment leap was a state with no king, right? Holy right. crap, right? Big deal. Yeah. Like, really big, big deal. deal. Um, you know, and pros and cons, for sure. Like, Hans Hoppe says, you know, net outcome, bad. But... Let's just say that it worked pretty well. Sure. Well, let's let's just. I want to say something about that real quick. Is how big of a deal it was. You're talking thousands of years up to this point, where the divine right of king is the same as having a birthday today. Right. It's your. It's that's just. It's in your psyche. The divine right of kings, his right to rule over this area or whatever it is. You. There was no thought otherwise. I mean, we, it sounds crazy now or whatever, but then you you were born and you automatically knew the king had the right to rule you. So it was a big deal, no matter what was set up, to break from a king and not have one. Huge. Let's – we could put it in a historical context. We can make up a historical context to put it in and then have a serious discussion about it like it's real. Okay. Um <laughs> Uh, this is what Jesus did for entry to heaven, kind of, right? Ooh. Before Jesus, entry entry to heaven is like hopefully you're hopefully you're is Israeli, hopefully hopefully you're yeah. an Israelite of the tribes right. of Israel, because like if you're a Gentile, like you're basically kind of a monkey, like you don't really have a soul, and like right, like. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, it has nowhere to go because you're not chosen. So, sorry. Um, and then Jesus comes along and like, bango. Guess what? There's this this place called heaven that's a little different than than what the Jews have previously described, or it's at least a concept, right? It's a concept of heaven. Let's talk about it that way. Right. And yep. free access to everybody. All you have to do is everything that is the hardest thing in your life to do. That's all you got to do, but it's free. It costs you zero dollars. Um, anyone from any status, it's free entry. It, it's equality yeah. of opportunity. You just have to do all of the hardest things you can imagine in life. Oh, man. And if you think about the parable of the workers, it's also equality of the outcome. It, indeed, it is equality of outcome as well. Fantastic. Uh, lay that on mm. me. Well, the uh, so I'll just I'll talk about the parable itself. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a farmer who is in great need of workers, so he goes out into the city and he says, "I need you to work my farm." And basically, I'll pay you. We'll just say I'll pay you twenty bucks to work the day. And he goes out in the morning hours. So let's say he goes out at six, and this guy's like, "Cool, I'm doing nothing. I'll make twenty dollars to work for you today." And the work's not getting done quick enough. He goes back out at, let's say, 10 and walks around and says, hey, I need more people. What will you pay me? I'll give you 20 bucks to work the rest of the day. Great. He goes out in the noon hour, gets some more people, offers them the same price. Now we're getting into one guy, what? And then he goes out at 3, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And they're all going to quit at 5 when the bell goes off or the whistle or whatever. And he offers them the same price. I'll give you 20 bucks. So the end of the day comes around. And everyone wants to come up to the boss. And I really like this. They get paid at the end of every day. That's pretty fantastic. He's giving them the money. The guys that start at 6 in the morning are like, what the crap? I worked for 12 hours, 11, 12 hours. 
and this guy got here three hours ago and you gave him $20 and you're giving me $20? And I love what he says to him about it because this is like a, uh, this is a real life thing for me because I deal with this with employees where they, where they gripe about whether it's fair that they got paid this and that guy got paid that, but I've been here longer, you know, it's the jealousy of whatever they're jealous of the way I give, which is none of their business. And he says, well, have I done you wrong? Well, uh, I no. Well, didn't you agree in the very beginning you would do this for me and I would pay you this amount? Well, sure, yeah. Okay. It's up to me to use my resources. And what I want to give to them, that's my prerogative, not yours. So while one worked less than the other, the outcome was the same so you had the you know which is something that we hate to talk about really um having equality of outcome oh well can't have that everyone's got a you you can't guarantee an outcome but in this one instance there's a guaranteed outcome well and then jesus does the same thing on the cross with the thief who dies next to him which really bothers people it does it does I mean, it. I, I know people that it's bothered. They're like, well, you know, like, how is he? <laughs> they they want to love. Well, Jesus was almost died, perfect, like, right? <laughs> but that forgiveness when the guy was dying, man, thumbs down. Uh, that guy didn't do jack to deserve it. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. Except That's expressing like... expressing unwavering uh, faith. That God existed, and right. and that you know, it's kind of like the woman uh, with at the temple who's only giving a little bit of money because that's all she has. Right. He only has a little bit of life left, and he he lets go of his ego entirely, and says, he gives his yeah. all. He gives everything he has at that moment, yep. and yep. and you could say there's a lot of ways you could look at it if you don't believe. That heaven is like this place in the clouds or whatever, right? Let's say that that's too mm-hmm. literal and it, it, you know, it's a buzzkill for you, right? Um, the the eternity in front of him, which is you know his death, and no one knows what death is like physiologically, right? Because nobody comes back from it. Um, that experience actually could stretch out over hours in real time, like the yeah. the networks in the brain. And you get this, yep. you get a very heavy release of this chemical called DMT when you die. And DMT is like A grade level, real deal, um, psychoactive. Like, if you want to have a psychoactive experience, you can take DMT synthetically. And, and, Many people have likened it to near-death experiences, and the spike in DMT mm. levels is similar. And what you get, you get massive time dilation. So over like a five or ten minute period of time, you have like two or three years worth of relative experience. Wow. Right? Like you go in and – anyway, um, which is what people – there's there's books on near-death experiences where people kind of come back and they talk about similar things. So physiologically, you yeah, might but... actually experience eternity as you die. And if you can the life flashing before your eyes, yeah, yeah, but it might be flashing really slowly from your frame of reference. Yep. And uh, so, anyway, think about think about letting go at the beginning, like you're about to have a really, really intense experience. You're about to have the most intense experience of your life, and it's <laughs> going to seem like it lasts forever. And you can either enter that experience knowing that you're an awful, terrible person. Or you can believe that God will have mercy on your soul and enter that experience in a state of absolute humility, right? And then it's like, you know, do you want to be in a torture chamber or on a roller coaster ride, right? You're in control of neither. Um, but uh, they're very different experiences. Hmm. For sure. Well, there's very different experiences on that, on the three crosses, because you had the the cross example right across the road there. The guy was screaming, hey, 
get us off of here. What are you doing? Come on. And there's actually a, from a certain point of view, a belief of the other thief that Christ was the divine that he said he was, right? Because he's like, hey, what do you, why are you letting this happen? Save yourself and save us too. While you're at it, bud, you know, get us all off of here. And um, almost in a belief that he can do it. And then the other thief, on the other hand, was completely different. He's like, well, we deserve what we're getting. Society's seen what we've done. We deserve to die. We're wretched. Hey, sorry, this is, you're, you don't deserve this. Just remember me. That's yeah. it. In my non-existence, remember me. Yeah. Yeah. And he, and he only talks to one. I've always thought that interesting, too. He doesn't even acknowledge, at least from what we can read, doesn't even acknowledge the other thief. Right? Doesn't say, well, you know, this is uh, you. you uh, uh. Just no acknowledgement at all. But he does acknowledge the other guy. Yeah. Peterson has... I, I always find a little bit... Of, I always find some kind of meanings. I haven't always figured out the meanings, but I figured there must be some meanings in these little tiny things. Dude, <laughs> there's so much in that story. You are you are enlightening me currently. I'm loving this. Um, so Peterson talks about prayer very occasionally, and somebody asked him about it at the uh, event I went to. They, mm-hmm. said, they asked him, does he pray? And he said, well, what? it depends on what you mean by pray. And he said, do I believe that God answers um, wish lists. No, I don't. Right. Uh, and then he described the kind of the kind of activity that he describes as prayer, which was interesting, um, and and it's too long to discuss. But anyway, <laughs> that's what you have going on on the cross there, like in that story. Yeah. The one guy's giving him a wish list. Hey, dude. Here's the here's the task list to get us to the end of this project. Um, you start on step one and then do all the rest of the steps as well. And uh, the other guy's going, the other guy, the other guy's going, this is the project. This is the project. This is the yeah. project of your life. And making your life better is about um, getting some perspective on who you really are. And he did. And he did. He admitted it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, that story in its gravity with setting people free from, you know, the idea that the king was God or or whatever led to a greatly reduced belief in um in that form of power, you know, and kings kings had divine right to be king. Um but the idea that they could control what you thought was no longer accepted as widely, right? They could control where you live and what you do. And they could take things from you, but they couldn't control your mind. They weren't allowed to do that. Oh, I, right? Absolutely. That was That's a theme throughout the whole uh, New Testament. Yeah. We, we live in this world, but we're not of this world. Richard Mayberry. We do with the all things to all mean. Right. Richard Mayberry talks about the Treaty of Westphalia. Have you ever heard him talk about that? Yeah. I just oh, I just yes. remembered that I saw him at a conference. He was at the KC Summit that I went to. Are you kidding me? Yeah, and it just never crossed my mind. I didn't know who he was back then. <laughs> nice. I mean, this is like this is like 11 years ago or something. Oh, I mean, wow. Anyway, yeah. So, um So, he talked about the Treaty of Westphalia, which ended what the the 20 Years' War, right? Isn't it 20 mm-hmm. years? I think it was 20 years. 30. 30 years war. There well, you go. I think it was 30s. Okay, whatever. It was a multi-decade war in Europe in, like, what, the 1500s, 1600s? Um, 15 to 16. Yep. Okay, it spanned, yeah. And this is funny. I got into this through being a watch nerd. I was looking at the history of Swiss watchmaking. And it all takes place oh, in this one valley. There's a small town, or there's two kind of towns next to each other. I'm going to get all that wrong, so I'll summarize by saying they were in the middle of that war and they negotiated uh, for peaceful passage of combatants. And so it was one of the few technological cities in Europe that didn't get leveled 
which is why they have technology there for watchmaking that no one else in the world to this day has. Wow. Yeah, they stayed neutral. Yeah, like long, long ago. Switzerland has that thing figured out. Anyway, yeah. Um, anyway, he was talking about that war. At the end of the war, there was the Treaty of Westphalia. And the Treaty of Westphalia, the war was over the idea of could the king dictate what you believe? That was the whole yep. war. And it went on for decades. In the end, um, the treaty says the state, the king can tell you where to live and how much tax to pay and what money to use. And blah, 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 blah. The king can tell you what to do with your physical body. But the king cannot tell you what to believe inside your mind or your heart. Right. Which was a big deal. Um, and that came, you know, that came after Christ. But, like, Christ kicked that idea off. And then so then this president thing, instead of a king, the U.S. Re revolution, same deal. Look at the time periods between those revolutions. Hmm. They're massive. Yeah. A long, a long train. A long oh, train of grievances and usurpations right yeah um i use that to describe many work situations with brian these days it's <laughs> hilarious uh, anyway <laughs> it's great to use it in a meeting because well, people think you're crazy <laughs> oh yeah that sounds great but it, it is it does work because i mean the whole thought of it is that you know, people are fine with putting up with crap for so long, and then and before there's this final it's, boiling point. It's the snow building on the mountain. Tipping point. It's the snow building on the mountain. Yep. Heavier and heavier Absolutely. and heavier, and then a little, a little cannon, boom, and it all falls down. And I wonder if it 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 had to take different minds springing up, because you can look through, you know, the the let's say the two thousand years since the death of Christ, whatever. And we can pick out through history singular people that rose up to keep the challenge going. Even if they had a lot of things wrong, you know, they're, um, so um, Luther, Martin Luther, you know, that was a guy that actually, he had a lot of it wrong, but, that was somebody that was challenging a little bit of thought at the time, the same that Calvin did, Thomas Aquinas did. Um, then I'm going to fast forward a long time to uh, Etienne de la Boite, to the John Locks, to the, you know, there's, um, and I'm missing a bunch of English guys in there, but, or the, oh, how about the uh, really important David matter Hume. In, in the history of mankind was in 12... Um, the Magna Charta. Yeah, 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 Huge. totally similar, right, right. And the Magna, Huge. the Magna Carta comes after massive war, <laughs> a bunch of war for sure, for sure. And these were big events, big events. So holding up, but 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 snow, more snow, more snow on top of that mountain, more snow. Yeah, I love that, man. That worked i just i don't i'm gonna have to think man about i wonder anything. does was the we might be hampering ourselves a little bit with thinking that the avalanche was the american revolution yeah well i mean what if that's just more snow sure now what's interesting so what got me on this is you'd made the comment about um i don't remember which which founding father? Uh, talking about anarchy. Oh, yeah. Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine. There you go. I knew it was a T. Didn't remember it was a P. Okay, so he's talking about anarchy. He's going, whoa, this is kind of like, this is kind of working. Okay, let me qualify the term. He's talking about a lack of a state. Right. And he's like, whoa, how's this working? And and then, you know, eventually it ended up not being a state, but it, or it ended up not being a non-state. But it didn't end up becoming a state through war right which was a first it became a state well no let's say it was a second it was the second time the first time that happened was with the israelites in the desert <laughs> yeah we are free give us a ruler 
Yep. So, so. This, uh, yeah, and we're, you're referencing Samuel, the prophet. Yeah. When they said, hey, this is great. Man, we're so free. Why can't we be like those guys that are oppressed? Which is, which is mind-boggling. And God says, ask and I, you shall receive. Yes, he does. And he even tells them, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the greatest part is, hey, <clears throat> which I've always thought is a lot like the, um, it's almost like De La Boete's, um copying that. Because De La Boete goes down this long list of, you know, the, how could he, how could he spy on you without your eyes? And how can he march you off the war without your sons? And he uses your daughters as his slave girls. How can he listen to you without your Amazon Echo? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, man, I saw that today. That's crazy. <laughs> but that's the same thing God said to him. Okay, I'm going to give you a king just like everyone else. And here's what he's going to do to you, suckers. And my favorite part of that, the thing that just sticks me right in the gut, is that someday you're going to repent that you ever asked me for a king and I won't listen to you. <laughs> it's like eating from the tree. Yes. You do not get to go back. Yep. I will not listen. That, that is a here. very instructive lesson for people who identify as anti-state today. Hmm. Right? Okay. Expand that. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of anti-statists today are like, well, it'd be nice if there weren't a state. We we should do what we can to reduce the size of the one that exists now because this may be the incremental path to not having a state. Right. When you could look at history or the stories of the Bible, let's say you don't interpret them literally, but you say, hmm, there's a lesson embedded in this. That's why they kept it written down for 5,000 years. and Which is impressive by itself. Right. Just to, main, to maintain that just because you like your – just because you like your stories is unlikely. They learned some lessons and they wrote them down. If you, have, if you run a business, you learn this when you have employees make the same mistake that's very expensive more than once. You're like, oh <laughs> – We've we've done this before. Did anybody write that one down? And it's like yes. yeah, and it's it's like we are writing it down now because we're not doing it again. Anyway, yes, that's, that's a, no, that's so important. Yeah, well, you have to learn you have to learn that the hard way. So there's probably a lot of history that get lost, right? Yeah, and lessons there is. So anyway, so if you, and it doesn't matter it. None of those things matter until you write them down. I've learned that. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's like the, the, the on, had... on the North Slope. They they make a game. Natalie was telling me about this. They make a game out of the rules, and so like you're always supposed to go down a ladder backwards with both the hands on both rails. And they have this really cheesy um, safety video, I guess. And everybody has to watch it, you know, every few months or whatever. And so it's like an inside joke if you're up there. You like every time you get on the stairs. And you go down the railing. I think you, you might have to rehearse this, but everybody does it really sarcastically. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that they do it sarcastically. So if you need to go down the stairs, you orient yourself, you know, so you're going back down the stairs with both hands on the railing. And you, you repeat the words from the video. You know, always go downstairs backwards with your hands on the rails. And so they'll get really theatrical with it to, to bag on the rule. Um, but it doesn't matter because they're repeating it to themselves every time they do it. So it works as a safety technique. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, well, I was thinking with, when you write down, like, um, you have a performance review or a, let's just say you have an employee that is repeating the same stupid thing over and over and over. It doesn't count, especially to the employee, until you write it down the first time. He might have done it 50 times, but you can't tell him, dude, this is the 50th time you've done this stupid thing. They don't care. Nobody's the only thing they look score. at is you write it down, then it's like, ah, oh, crap, it's on paper. I've got two more times or one more time or no right. more time. Right. I've I've lived that. Right. And it's, it's very frustrating because my mind's going, 
beep, beep, beep. No, this guy is a problem way back here. And sometimes when you write it down, that problem disappears. Yeah, man. It's articulating uh, articulating a path through the problem at hand. It's almost like this, it's the simple thing of actually putting pen to paper or typing it on the deal is all of a sudden, okay, this is serious business. They actually took the time to write this down. You know, that's, I'm in trouble. That same, tec- that same technique works on yourself. Yeah, I was way, actually knew you were going to go jump on that. Yeah. And it makes sense. Yeah. It absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, I wonder how them cultural Marxists are doing. Yeah, so the cultural Marxists, <laughs> I had another thought. I, well, I said there were three, no, there were three I'm things. Not, I'm having fun. I said there were three things that I thought about them. And I said one of them, I've now forgotten the second one. I've remembered the third one. And the third one is fun. I'm going to, this is a very different perspective to have about them, but I'm going to throw it out there because we're edgy and perspective-y on this podcast. Nice. So the third one is that um, we were asking, what are these kids? Are they revolutionaries who want to overthrow the you know the thing they want to become classical marxists right and then i think the second point i had was something along the lines of maybe they maybe they do just want the social stuff but i don't remember that thought so the third thought i had was they're scared they're scared kids they were raised for a world that doesn't exist and now that they're in it they're crying they're they're sitting on the sidewalk like and it's raining out and it's dark and there's thunder and lightning and they don't know what street they live on. No one told them what street they live on. And so it's not just that they're lost, it's that they can't even find their way back to where they live. They don't know where they live. And they're on the street wow. crying and the only thing that they can do when you walk by is run at you and try to embed themselves inside of you. So you can take them with you because they never learned how to ask for help. And, Hmm. and they look so bad. They're in such a bad place that they look like, you know, you see the, you see the guy on the street and you'll go, man, that guy's having a hard time. But the actual risk to my life by approaching him outweighs my ability to follow Christ's admonition for it, for me to love him. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And so socially, these kids are in that situation. They're, they Are they going to peddle you for crack, you know, or for money for crack? You don't know. And so the only option they have is to attack because they're so, so damn scared. Man, but that really has to change. Well, I guess I don't want to speak for everyone. For me, okay, to look at it that way, that puts a different aspect on the way I have to look at them. Personally. Yeah, yeah. I know. It gets really uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Yes. I can't look at them like... So, like, the first aspect of are they trying to become cult, uh, classical Marxist, that gives me one perspective to look at them. And that's pretty much enemy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though there's a long talk about the enemy part. But but this this one's more of, man... Someone that's just in pain and they're scratching out. Have you seen um, what's that movie? It's an older one, I think, in the sixties. Uh, Look who came for dinner. I think it's called. No, I have not seen that. It's about um, it's about a white girl who gets engaged to a black guy, and she brings him home for dinner. And so the white people are trying their best to act like they're not racist, right? And they're having a really hard time. Well, when the black mom and dad find out about it, and they're they're more of a, uh, you know, um, maybe more of a conservative family type black family. But the dad, the black dad, the black father, when he finds out she's he's gonna his son's gonna marry a white girl, he flips out. He's like, "What are you doing? What are you doing to me?" About and. The reason I thought of this was 
what you were just talking about where these people are scared because the dad says to him, they get in this heated argument and the dad's bringing up, you know, I raised you, I paid for everything, blah, blah, blah. And he says, you owe me. And the kid said something. Well, he's a grown man, but the the son said something that like hit me right between the eyes because he said, I don't own you. I don't owe you Jack. I didn't ask to come here. I didn't ask to be born. You brought me into this world. You owe me everything. And I that just was like, whoa, that's pretty huge. He's but he's he, in a certain point of view, he's right. He didn't ask to be born to that family in that household. The dad knew what the situation was in the household before they had this child, and they brought him into it. And I don't know, it just uh, was really interesting between what the dad thought, you know, I've done all this for you, and you owe me now, where the kid was like, yeah, you, that was free. You owe me all that, because you brought me and put me in this situation from the beginning, Jack. Okay, you ready for, I have a question for you. Okay. Okay. So, could you take that story and interpret it for me in the context of the story of Job? Job? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Except for... Hmm. Yeah. Job. Man. Job's a historical figure in the Bible. Don't know who or about what time... And, and I'm, I'm only re- saying this because this is part of the story. All the fascinating stuff, I think, has to be talked about to, to put everything in perspective in it. It's kind of like defining the terms. Yeah, yeah. Um, the best we know now is that Moses actually wrote the book of Job, which the first time I heard that blew my mind. I was like, what? That doesn't make sense. Chronologically, it's way back here. <laughs> that doesn't fit. But Job apparently lived before the flood and all this. And um, I don't know how much you want me to delve into this because, I, man, I could go for days. I love this story. Um, well, but, just, just what we need to relate it to Right, to relate it to that. So, but it's kind of actually the opposite of that because Job looks at, at God after all these things happen to him. And he knows darn well that God allowed it to happen because they got this relationship going on. And he kind of challenges God to this. And he's like, hey, you know, what the heck? You brought me here. And I kind of think he does it a little sneaky. Because on one side, he's kind of given the platitudes. You know, he says, I was naked when I came here. I can't change the conditions of how I live here. Blessed be the name of the Lord, no matter what, you know. But then when he actually gets to have interaction with God. And that, that's the front he put in front of his friends and his wife. It's the three friends that come and visit him. He he puts the front up of, ah, it's not God's fault. You know, I'm not going to blame him. Yada, yada. But then when he when he has a conversation with God himself, he goes, "Hey, why did you do this to me? Better I was never born. I would rather have never been born." He goes on and on lamenting his life and yada yada. And then it's God's turn to basically contradict him. And God kind of points out, well, your life is pretty good. You know, you're going to bitch just because things went bad for a while. There's worse off people out there. And finally, he kind of stops him and says, wait a minute. Who are you to even question me? I made you. I made the earth. I set the limits of the boundaries of the waters. I made it fascinating book because he talks about how he made horses and why he made horses and the attitude of a horse under a man. And he talks about Leviathan. Could you make Leviathan? I did. Leviathan could destroy you. I made him. And so the opposite of the story of that movie is the created telling the creator, you owe me everything. And in Job, God says, I don't owe you Jack. Yeah, I'm saying I'm saying that's the same as the movie. The father is telling the son. Oh, okay. Right. No, he is saying That's that. what I'm saying. And the son, right. 
And the son is saying, no, you owe me because you brought me here and blah, blah, blah. And the father is saying, no, Jack, I've already done everything for you. Right, right. So I'm, take, I'm taking the side of the father in the movie. Right. Which is No, I see what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, I'm not taking his side, but I'm just saying that's the... No. You know. I've taken both sides of it because I thought it was interesting what the kid said to the dad. And the first time I saw it, I wasn't a dad. And I thought, dang. I actually was on the dad's side. I was like, now hold on here. He's already done everything. You, you punk, mm-hmm. back off. Who do you think you are? Why don't kick you out of the house? Well, then when I became a dad, I have more per- the perspective for the kid. Like, yeah, I brought you here. I need to do everything I can to. But you're right. I see where, I see exactly what you're saying. And it is the same thing. You have the bratty kid basically going, I didn't ask to be here. I didn't ask for this. Blah, blah, blah. The dad's already given him everything. The God has already given Job everything. Kind of like, now go out on your own two feet, boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> grow up, boy. Yeah. That's the story of Job, I think, is grow up, boy. Don't sure. question me. Good grief. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, that's an old, uh, it's an old thing. It's a, you know, should the created be the master of the creator? Or does the student lessen the master? Uh, of course not. Is the is the emissary ever in a place to disobey the orders of the master? Uh, apparently, if you're ambassador to the UN, but only then. <laughs> right. That's so. This is the same. This is what that Ian McGill, McGillchrist book is about. Right. With left brain, right brain. Um, the left brain society. Has put, has put the son in charge of the father. Hmm. It's put the rational mind in charge of the holistic mind. Wow! I came in. I, I didn't choose to be here. Me, me, me. Versus, when you came into this world, you had nothing, and you have more than nothing, right. because I exist. Right. And that's kind of a fun play for both sides. I mean, because if you want to look at uh, the book of Job, for one, Job got a pretty crappy deal. He got a pretty crappy because deal. Because basically you got, uh, you know, this dude Lucifer, literally, in my perspective, is hanging out, walking around goes and sees the god of hosts he he walks up to the throne and he's just kind of i don't know it's almost like he's just kicking rocks hey what have you been up to where have you been oh just walking to and fro and i love what god says to him he says have you considered my boy job there's no one like him and i think that i know i was saying this to you but it's been going through my mind more it's an ab abomination or uh Oh, that's not the right way to say it. He's he's telling Lucifer, hey, have you noticed him? Hello, check this guy out. Because he said that. Have you considered him? That's a strange word to use. Have you, I mean, if you consider something, that means you're pondering, thinking. You know, he didn't say, well, did you happen to notice or did you happen to see him when you're walking by? Have you heard of him? Have you considered him? So I think there's something that he's saying to I don't know. Maybe I'm putting I love Jordan that. Peterson spin on it, but I think he's saying something to Satan or to Lucifer at the time because he knows the heart of Lucifer who is arrogant, mad, pissed off, and he has everything. You know, he's the high angel. He's got it pretty good. He's one step below God. And he says, well, have you considered this man? No one follows me better than him. <laughs> Consider that, Lucifer. Here's a tasty morsel. Yeah. Catch it if you can. Yep. And and what I think is interesting is that Satan says to him, "Well, the only reason he is because you've done good to him. Well, you know, why wouldn't he? You know, you're blah blah blah." 
And it's almost like a, uh, well, duh, Lucifer, don't you have everything? But look at the way you're acting. Look at the path you're going down. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, he goes and he takes everything from Job. And Job gets a crappy deal. I mean, he loses the thing that hurt me the most. Not the 10,000 sheep. He loses all his kids in the same day. Yeah. His seven sons and four daughters. Right. Devastation. And what's funny is that when Satan goes back, hey, what have you been up to? Oh, just walking to and fro. Hey, remember that guy Job? Have you considered him? I let you do these things to him. And yet he's still this righteous man that I told you he was. Oh, well, it's just because... I didn't get to strike his flesh. Because the previous thing, God said, do whatever you want with his stuff. Don't touch him. The second time he says, well, if I touched him, then then you'll see him fall down and curse your name. I'll go ahead. And I still think, I don't know why, but this is just maybe because it's fun to think this way. I still think it's an admonition to Lucifer. It's almost like, hey, think about this. I know where you're going. You're getting ready to be the star falling out of heaven, Jack. And he doesn't get it. And he hits hits Job again. The boils, you know? Which, I don't know. I've never known anyone with boils like that. But he's extreme pain. And that's when he said, the Lord tastes, Lord, Lord gives, the Lord tastes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His friends come to, um, <laughs> you know, it's like we need these kind of friends. That's kind of the, uh, <laughs> what we talk about when, with the the time preference of friends, right? You finally figure out who your friends really are. These guys come in and like, Ugh, you know, you've had it good and everything's fine. Why don't you just curse God and die? And his wife, his soulmate, is like, why don't you just curse God and die? Get it over with. And he won't do it. So he does have a beef. So I can see his side of it when he's saying to God, hey, I had it good. I haven't changed I was a good man. You even said, look at my boy over here. Nothing can persuade him to do wrong. Why did you do that to me? And still, God says, how dare you even ask me that question? <laughs> and, but not not in the way that I just said that. Because he does talk to him. He does commune with him and discuss the whole thing. But in the very end, he says, now hold on. You're dealing with the wrong dude here. I'm God. Yeah. Yeah. And it was that thing that uh, I was mentioning. Uh, when you put God, so Job tries to put God on trial and ends up being on the witness stand. Yeah, right. He's the one that ends up having to give account. Because even through all that, God says, give account for your life. Who are you? Why should I take notice of you? Which is funny because he's really giving him a smackdown because he says it. He notices the sparrows when they fall. He clothes the ground with grass. He does all these things. But who are you that I should be mindful of you? It's pretty interesting. You know, can I uh, can I run with this for a couple minutes? Absolutely. I've been okay. running with it for too long anyway. No, no, I've enjoyed that. I, I have a bunch of comments, but... Um, they wouldn't build on anything that you said. So I'm just going to give a, a, a different angle um, on this. So you were talking about to his friends and the people who knew him, he stayed, um, let's say he stayed humble, okay? Mm -hmm. But when it was time to talk to God, he was like, hey, man, this is a pretty raw deal. I'm not happy about it. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, so check it out. There's another way to look at this, which is that the let's let's pretend the story is is more than factual. Okay, sure. Let's say it's a metaphorical story as well. So, the story is kind of saying that he didn't lose his faith, even though he questioned God in the middle of his turmoil, right? Right, because yeah. he didn't discard. He didn't tell God, "Get away from me," which is what his friends wanted him to do. He didn't do that. Um, he told his friends, "Hey, no, I'm down. Like me and Big G are down. Like still." And uh, 
but internally he had doubts. But doubts were different than doubts were different than a loss of faith. Doubts were a part right. of building faith. Yep. So um, this is also like this is something a lot of people have trouble with. I have trouble with this. Um, negative self talk. Like you familiar with that? Yes. I mean, like when things aren't going your way, you got to put on a brave face, and it makes a difference for your psychology. But man, when things are not going your way, you get stuff that goes through your head. And um, a lot of people beat themselves up for that. Uh, For allowing it. For allowing it, right. But Job had it. And, And it was fine. It was part of the process. And of course he had it. I mean, look at his situation. I mean, that's one thing. It's like your situation could be a lot worse than than you think because Job had it way worse. Um, And at the same time, he had doubts and he questioned. But the way in which he addressed it, he had an honest conversation with with God. And you could look at that as, you know, he had an honest conversation with uh, Peterson characterizes God as the best within us. Okay. right. So you could say. When you're down, are you having an honest conversation with the best within you? Are you still seeking to be the best you can? Or not even seeking to be the best you can, but seeking to allow um, the part of you the part of you that God calls forth to be the part of you that you present to the world, right? Right. So, which is... Which is fascinating. And that's kind of what got Job out of it. Like, he was professing his faith to his friends and then questioning it in his head. But um, it was a freedom thing, right? He had the freedom internally to have a conversation. But if he had that conversation externally, that would be a risky maneuver. Well, because the... It might have... It might have opened him up for his friends to attack him in areas that he couldn't have stood you know what i mean if he allowed that um that doubt it'd be like an arrow for his buddies because they wanted him to doubt they wanted him to just say curse god and die which is pretty interesting that just cursing god automatically means he's dead that's kind of strange but if he would have allowed the doubt it would have just been firepower ammo for his buddies and he might not have been able to handle that because psych you know in his psyche he's already allowed that to be opened up boom Mm -hmm. now we're gonna get him yeah like the sharks going after the blood right it's 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 it it's that's a fascinating way to describe it but um yeah and yet the the great part of the story is that is the part that i think people you know, especially people that don't believe in God, but even people that believe that there's a God, is that God welcomed the interaction. Now, he's the one that says, search me and know me. Search me and know me. He's the one that says, come, let us argue. And he says, um, let us argue together, logically. That's literally what he says in Isaiah 1.1, I think it is, or whatever the exact verse is. He said, but he's, the, the Bible says, come let us reason, he says. But when you take it literally, it's come let us argue logically together. That's fascinating. So you have the God being saying to creation being, hey, I don't mind. Let's have a conversation. Dude. Search God, me out. God being and creation being. That fits. So Peterson says God is the logos. Right? Right. Which is what the, the Bible. Logic. Yeah, exactly. And that nature Um, you know, nature is the chaos, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the balance between, this is why nature is, uh, it's it's something like, this is how God speaks creation into being, is God brings order to the chaos, and at the intersection, at the intersection of God and nature is man. Man's the chaos. (laughs) <laughs> man's the intersection point because man has within him the ability to transcend the chaos, which is what Christ did. Right. Uh, but, and that, so man is on the precipice of that, which is, you know, you could talk about the breath of life and things like that. But yeah, man mm-hmm. tends, man naturally tends towards the chaos, right? Gra- yeah. Gravity pulls you down, you know? 
Um, but with struggle, he can um, he can seek to find the balance between the order and the chaos, between who he is and who he could be. Well, even the and people are going to have to get used to this in their podcast because I always have to interject Bible stuff, deal with it, or turn it off. In the Bible, it also says, um, you know, the Apostle Paul says, God is not a God of chaos, but a God of order. That's pretty profound right there because he's not, he doesn't like chaos. He, he is not chaos. Everything about him is order. So you can search the chaos or you can go after the order. The choice is right there. Do you want to be chaos and live chaos? We all know what that life is like. Or do you want to search order and logic, which is what he says to do. Come search me out. Question me. Yeah. I'll stop. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, that's that's very interesting. That's very interesting. Let me think about that. Totally. That's the fun thing about being on radio or podcast that we do to each other. You do to me all the time where I just have to stop. I don't have anything to say because I need to chew on it a little bit, think about it. And it's fun to do. It is fun to do. It is fun to do. Uh, Maybe we need to get like the, um, uh, what's the music for? Jeopardy. Oh, that'd be good. So we can just punch that in while we're thinking so there's no dead air. Get 30 seconds. Yeah. That's a great idea. Dang. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to, I'll think out loud here. Sure. Because that's what good <laughs> radio is better and podcasts are better when you think out loud because it comes through better on the recording. Well, uh, and it's also fun too, um, as friends, to think out loud because we're, um, we can learn from each other's thought and way of thought. That's very true. That's very like, true. Like, I'm going to, I'll learn more about what you're going to say. If I understand the way that you come to that saying, to that notion, or to the thought, true, and vice versa, yes, I mean, you you know that about me because you've told me exactly how I am on several occasions. No, you're the story guy. <laughs> oh right, right, yeah, you are the story guy. <laughs> um. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so so yes, God represents. Represents order. I'm just I'm tying this stuff back to Peterson stuff. Yeah, just because it's been on my mind. And so uh, the father figure. Peterson talks about the father figure as a as a character. Okay, and the father mm-hmm. figure always has onerous rules that keep the kid down. You know, and so the kid has to break out and break all the rules and find out that. Um, It is necessary to break rules sometimes, but making a habit of it leads only to sorrow. Mm. Right? They have to learn both because they have to go out. They have to go and break the rules to learn the lessons that the rules were there to teach. Does that make sense? Right. Absolutely. And so um, the rules have to be broken within bounds in order for for them to learn. So they learn the importance of breaking rules and they also learn why you don't want to break rules at the same exact time. Um, (laughs) Which is to say they learn it instead of just academically know it. Right. Okay, so then they come back. They come back or they have to rescue their father. He talks about like Pinocchio has to go down to the ocean, bottom of the ocean and rescue Geppetto from inside the whale. And Peterson Mm -hmm. says that's a metaphor for... You grow up and you have all these lessons your father taught you or whoever that figure is in your life, okay? And you go, yeah, but what do they know? I know better. And so you go out and you make a fool of yourself. And then at some point you wake up in the gutter and you go, man, uh, my dad was right. And you break. You break a little bit. And a little bit of your ego leaks out and a little bit of your dad's wisdom leaks in. And... And that's rescuing your father from the depths, right? You're going back into who you were and you're saying, this thing I rejected was good. I'm going to reintegrate it into my life and move forward as a as an adult. And this is when Pinocchio becomes a real boy. It's when he rescues his father from the depths, which you could, huh. you could call the prodigal son, right? 
The right. prodigal son is welcomed back because he came back. Right? Yep. The act of c- yeah. coming back uh, was sufficient to be welcomed back, uh, which tells you that it's the act. It's the act. It's not, it's not so much what did you do, it's where are you going right now. Um, have you turned it around? Sure, that's another parable when um, the the father that goes to his son and says, hey, I need you to go out and do this for me. And the son says, screw you. I'm not going to do that. Uh, he goes to the next son and says, hey, I need you to go out and do this for me. And the son says, okay, I'll do it, Dad. Yep, you bet. Love you. Okay. And doesn't do it. But the first son repents from what he thinks and says, you know what? I was wrong. I was an ass. I'm going to do it. Which one obeyed? Yeah, <laughs> the second one. The first one. The first one, yeah. The second one said he'll do it, but then he just sat on his butt and never did anything. The yeah, 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 the second, right, exactly. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then he actually does it, so it is the act. Yeah. It, Which son obeyed? It yeah. is yeah. the act. That's Where is that one from? Um... Let's see. I'm. I don't remember. I know it's a parable, of Christ. It's a Christ parable. Let's see. I'll find it pretty quick. What? Bing, bing, bing. Matthew twenty-one twenty-nine. So I'll just I'll read it real quick, just because it's fun. And that way someone can go, oh, you liar. Didn't say that. <laughs> so Jesus says, what do you think? A man has two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work the vineyard today. The boy answered, I will not. But later he had a change in heart and he went. The father went to the other son and said the same thing. The boy said, I will, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did his father's will? They said the first. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Tax collectors and prostitutes will go ahead of you into the kingdom of God. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, but you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And although you saw this, you did not change your minds to believe. Yeah. I do remember. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are saved because they do it. Yeah. I do remember that story now. Yeah, having the, uh, I kind of, you know context always helps instead of just this dude (laughs) yeah yeah totally totally yeah that's a fun one and i i think that what he was if i remember correctly they asked him well how do we know we're obeying god is what it is and he says well you tell me the act the doing it which which is pretty huge because it's not just a thing of believe, right? He says the uh, faith without works is dead. When he says you have to, you know, when he says, um, when did when did we feed you? When you fed the hungry guy? When did we clothe you? When you clothed the naked guy? When did we visit you in jail? When you went to jail and, and visited with the people there? The act. Yeah. These are my people. Yeah. Yeah. So well, we need. Okay, go. Check this out. I, Talking about acting. So this was this is the second half of my thought with um, the neo or the the social Marxists. Yes. Okay. First half of the thought, just to recap, was that it's possible that they are not trying to become violent Marxists and that they are just really scared and lost. Okay. Hmm. And so, if that is the case. Even if it's not the case, the, the well, Christ instructs believers to treat them with mercy, right? And, yep. like, how interesting would it be? Let's say, I mean, we all interact with these people on a daily basis as individuals, and it's not that, yeah. it's not that weird. It's just when they're in a group, you know, when they get together and write things on signs. Right. 
Yeah. And, but that's not how you interact <laughs> with them. So let's say in your daily life you interact with, you know, somebody under the age of 30 or something like this, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're talking to, like, you run into them at the store, you're talking to them, and you go, hey, man, how's your, how's your stuff going? Like, how's your life going? Are you, hmm. you know, are you, like... You, be, you having an okay time or is there is there stuff you know we know we know a bunch of these people ourselves we were, yep. we were talking about this the other night with uh, friends not really um, yep. libertarians leaving each other way too much alone or you know let's say anti-statists right because it's like live and let live and it's like okay I'm not going to get into anybody's business but there's a difference in getting into somebody's business and asking like how are you feeling right now? Are you good? Do you need to talk to somebody? Like I am here to to talk if you have something you want to say. So and that's uh we don't even do that with our own friend. Right. Right. So if I mean, yeah. Be you know, begin with, you know, clean up your own room first, but like that could be a different way that could be a different way to talk to these people. And like if if they had – if you're a scared 25-year-old kid who, who's just found out that the world is hard and sad um, and your parents are still – you can't talk to your parents about it because it's one of those things, right? Yep. And you know a couple adults, you know, but you don't really – you're not – you don't know how to talk to them about it. Um. You know, you're going to hang out with people who feel the same way and you're going to grumble about it. You're going to find your other, you know, young friends and you're going to go, stuff Stuff is a raw deal. This is lame. Um, we've been set up. You know, we've been had. We were told the world was a certain way. It turns out it's a different way. And so it must be a giant scam and they're out to get us and we need to burn it all down. Okay. Which is a very, a very quick road. Like that's not a long road that's a that's a few weeks or something right yeah but if they have a couple adult friends in their life you know i'm using the term adult friend like somebody who's been around for a while longer and had different experiences and been taken down a peg every once in a while and then put stuff back together you know right um if they have some of them in their life and they're going hey are you okay is there something you want to talk about they could be like yeah there is something i want to talk about this sucks this whole thing sucks. What the hell? Um, then you got a conversation. Be like, tell me about what sucks. You know, why do you think it sucks? Tell me about your situation. What's going on in your life? What were your expectations? And then you're in a real conversation with them. And, and you can say, yeah. Um, you can just listen and talk to them. And at some point, they'll, they'll go, how's your stuff? Or they might, right? They'll eventually do that. And you can say, yeah. you know, hey, my stuff's not great either. Let me tell you about let me tell you about being part of the ruling class. Um, you're always broke because your taxes are crazy, and you've done a bunch of other stuff in your life. You know, like you're not just renting somewhere. You got a house that breaks down or freezes up in the winter. You got to get that fixed. You know, yeah. juggling a family, trying to run a company, which is the best way to lose money. Um, that's for sure. You know, all this stuff. And like, yeah, let me tell you about let me tell you about owning a business. Like you eat last. If you own the business, you eat last, which means you sometimes don't eat. Exactly. And like they don't know. They don't know. Right. And then it's like, you know, we're we're not that different. We're not that different. You have better potential than I do because you're younger. Um but I have more experience than you do. But we're both we're both fighting as hard as we can against the current to hold still. And that's called life. Right. The, the thing we have in common. Yeah, that's the thing we got in common. I mean, that would be, it would be revolutionary if each of these, let's say half of the kids who are really, really upset right now, let's say half of them had that conversation with or were listened to by somebody who is on the other side of that phase of their life. It would be the, it would be the end of it. It would be the end yep. of the protests and stuff. And it would be the beginning of a much more meaningful transformation of the society. Mm. You know, the, having the open ears will tend to an open mouth. Ah, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, that there's a reference there too. I want to bring up the uh, which is the hardest thing in the world. We're we're told in the Bible to love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you, and that's like no, that's not cool. The guy's an a hole. I can't stand him. But but there's a reason for it because you'll. It's, it, that thing goes on, right? People stop there too much. They they got to keep going. Where he says that you'll reap coals on his head, and he'll repent from the way he's treating you, basically. So what you're doing is you're 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 turn kind of the turn the other cheek when these guys are screaming and freaking out. We're gonna rah, rah, rah. just show mercy back. You know, mercy something we've talked a lot to each other about lately. Show mercy back. And apparently, the promise is that that will affect them, and they'll repent from that, and not have that same attitude towards you the next time you see them. It might be three or four times. That's probably why he says, how many times do I forgive my brother? And he says, 70 times 7, which, keep doing it. But eventually, those coals will open up to some, the coals on his head will open something up. Uh They, They won't. They won't treat violence with, you know, in, they won't keep their violence up when you treat them that way. And I don't think that, I don't know. There's something to that. There's a reason why it's there. <laughs> yeah, well, I have two quotes from the Buddha on this, if you would like to hear them. Absolutely. Um, the first one is that holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal with the intent of throwing it at someone else. You are the only one who gets burned. And the other... Yeah, it's pretty good. And the other one is always be mindful of the kindness and not the faults of others. Which I had, I have a thought on that I, that I actually had last night. Which is similar to that. And it is to it is to accept the limitations of your society that you see in others. And the reason for that is because if, if you're like honest with yourself, um, you have those same limitations within you. Like you grew up in the same society and you might not see those limitations, but they're within you. And so when you reject when you reject the limitations of others, you're rejecting yourself. So in order to really accept yourself, you have to accept your limitations and those of others. It's kind of like the uh, we're all in this together, we're not in it at all. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Like you're part of your society whether you like it or not. <laughs> Which a lot of times tends to be or not. Oh yeah, no, I like that's what I'm saying. That's why it was like I was writing that down. And I was like, oh, this is brutal. <laughs> uh, but it huh. sets you. It sets you free, though. It sets you free yeah. in many ways. Right, and that's kind of the point, right? Yeah. It's to break the chains, to break off the bondage. I mean, to live. We talk obviously a lot about being physically free but it's so much more and such more work to be emotionally and spiritually free you know if we worked more on spiritual freedom with other people with the interactions that we have with people the physical freedom comes by itself I mean it's like we've been fighting the wrong battle for too long, beating our heads up against the wall. Oh, yeah, well, I know more facts about cultural Marxism than you do, and Marxism (laughs) doesn't work, and rah, 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 and I know about Marx, and I read him, and I read this guy, and I read that guy, and I know everything there is to know about everything, so you're wrong. How's that work? Not. We're actually losing. That attitude, we're losing because of that attitude. Instead of going right to the spirit and say, hey, I got it. I get it. Might not understand it completely. Tell me. Yeah, well, I stand let's, I stand come, at the door and knock, us, right? Right. Let's reason together. Yeah, we're we're so busy trying to free everyone physically 
And you can't be physically free and spiritually oppressed. Well, even if you're physically free, you're still going to die. Exactly. Like it doesn't mean anything. And, and miserable if you're spiritually oppressed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, right, right. Yeah, do you want to be... Do you want to be... Yeah, Paul wrote about that. Yeah. When he was in prison. Yep. Exactly what I was going to say. You're much better off being able to sing songs in prison than be miserable in your freedom in day-to-day life. <laughs> Pretty brutal. And we know people. I mean, we're, we're, we're those people. Oh, yeah. No, no. I'm, I, I have been and am intermittently there. Right. And it is a suck place to be. It's a suck place to be, man. <laughs> man. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, we've been bannering around it for a long time. And our, not just our outlook on our life, but our outlook of, of our interaction with other people's lives has got to change. Yeah. We've, we've been doing it wrong. Yeah. And that's hard because it's 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 really easy to be smart and know the facts, but it's hard to be compassionate. Yeah, this is this is McCarthy's deal in that Emmanuel Charles McCarthy in that Behold the yeah. Lamb number nine. Hmm. You know, are people when people think of who you are, are they gonna go that's a really merciful person? Or are they going to say, well, they're smart or they're, they're very just, right? <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, or they're very religious or something like that. Are they, or is the first thing going to be like, yeah, they are incredibly merciful. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a, uh, there's a story that goes along with that. The, uh, the merciful shall receive mercy. Yeah. Which makes me tend to think the unmerciful won't. Yeah. Yeah. And I love what you said, uh, you said a few times, is on your dying, on your deathbed, you're not going to say to God, please give me justice. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's another <laughs> McCarthy deal. Yeah. Right. Well, dude, no. check this out. The merciless can receive mercy if those who have mercy are giving it to them. Right. Which is the ultimate negotiation tactic because you're saying, you're saying that you've already won. Hmm. Right. I mean, like this is, um, this is, this goes back to the Anabaptists, right? The Mennonites not putting up resistance ever to anything yep. and still existing. It's like, hey, we're going to kill your family if you don't go along. You're like, okay, that's fine. Yep. We have already won. You can There's a book, and I can't remember the guy's name. He was the defector from the Soviet Union, and he was in the NK, whatever, DV. He was the secret, secret police dude, and he... the. He writes a biography of when he was in the Soviet Union, and he loved, I mean, his job was to imprison Christians. And he loved nothing more than to get in, find them, find their churches or whatever, and just beat the crap out of them. I mean, he, he's really graphic in his portrayal of himself of breaking arms, pummeling faces to pulp, and whether they're men, women, and kids. Would no matter to him, he'd break kids' legs. He would beat a wife, a guy's wife, right in front of him until she was just a literal puddle of blood, and then haul him off to jail. And then he would proceed to beat them until they would reject their faith. And these people, I think it was a particular woman that he was beating and raping and beating and beating and beating. You know, the horror of worst, and she would pray for him. And it eventually got under skin where he's just like, knock it off. Quit doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and to the point where he finally said, I'm done. 
Who is, how can you do this? Who is inside of you that lets you do this while I'm doing this to you? Why don't you hate me? Well, and, and he converted to Christianity and left the Soviet Union. Ended up in uh, some the shore of Van, um, British Columbia somewhere. I forget exactly how he escaped, but it was fascinating that while he was doing these horrible things, the mercy that was given back to him completely changed his mind. And he was the best of the best in his profession. Yeah. yeah. Well, no one, no one and, is beyond redemption, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. By just a little bit of mercy being shown back. And these people have the right to hate him completely. Yeah. You know, that's... That's interesting, too. Sometimes you, you may have the right to hate someone. You may have think you have the right to be lash out and be violent back to someone, but it doesn't mean you should. Well, let's say you do have the right, and it's justified. Mm-hmm. Does it make your life any better? <laughs> No. I mean, I still, I catch myself doing this the other day. The other day I did it. I was, I was having an extremely negative uh, phone interaction with a support line. And it was just ridiculous. And, and I didn't have time. Like, you know, I didn't have time. So I was like, eh, this is not going in a productive direction. Click. And, uh, I mean, they were probably more relieved than I was, but, uh. But, like, why didn't I have the time? If I didn't have the time, I shouldn't have made the call. And mm. and what out, what outcome did I expect? Like, I brought my own expectation into that. You right. know, didn't regard the the person on the other, you know, they're just, they just got a bad job. Like, that's not their fault. Um, but yeah, and it probably sucks. It definitely sucks. But, it, man, it is hard. It is hard to do that kind of stuff. I mean, the road rage, the road rage is the classical one, right? Yeah, I don't know anybody who. Let me think about that. It's very hard to find people who don't blow up when they're driving. Oh yeah, yeah. Drive a semi in town. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But yeah, anyway, right. th- there's those those opportunities are endless. They are always there, and uh, and I am very bad at them. But after that, like, I was like, right after I hung up, I was like. Mm. That was not good. And so it went on my list. It went on my daily list. Huh. You know, spend five minutes thinking about this and working on it. Da-da-da. Well, is is that reaction from us thinking that our time and ourselves are more valuable than the time we're with the person we're interacting with? I mean, you're you're basically saying, I'm more valuable than your – my life's more valuable than your life by – yeah. And and which is a natural thing to do. I mean, we're born into that. That's why little babies scream and cry. It's like, my life matters right now. Feed me. And we basically just grow up doing that for the rest of our lives with other people. My life matters more than yours. Your life sucks. And I need my gratification <laughs> now instead of you know, maybe that guy. You know, that is such a mind blowing thing, Dave, of. What if that, I mean, this is just crazy. What if that person, you had a different conversation with them, and that person opened up something to you like, man, you know what? Uh, appreciate you having patience with me. I've had a bad day of blah, 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 or that. And you have this conversation, and then five minutes later, you're like buddies, and you helped him get through another week where he didn't mass murder everyone in his in his uh, office. <laughs> no, that's real deal. <laughs> yeah, it that's, is real. Yeah, that's serious. I mean, that's serious. And that was... The domino effect of that was like, that hit me. And, you know, and it was like, okay, you have identified something that you are bad at that you need to be better at. Write it down. Fix it. That was uh, kind of um, Richard Mayberry's point last week on the show was, you know, you got uh, real people in, man, he got pretty emotional about it too. He was like, these kids are in real pain what drives someone to shoot and kill somebody else and then themselves that is some serious pain who's listening to them nobody 
who's stopped and said, how's your day? What's going on? Nobody. You're right. And that's some agony, man. And that agony gets expressed through more agony to more people. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. You know, and you read stuff about that where after the, the fact, you know, you, you read things in the newspaper where a neighbor will say, man, I never knew that was going on. I wish I would have said something to him or a parent or a friend or no, he had no idea he was going through that. Everybody who vaguely knows them has that experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Crazy. A little bit of a life lesson, maybe. Yeah, probably a probably a big full size life lesson. <laughs> but it's so hard. It is so hard. Hmm. I guess it's just something you have to decide. Well, like you said, you wrote it down and you thought about it. It's something you got to decide whether it's worth your time. Which really what it comes down to, is it worth your time? And then you have to figure out what your time means. What it's, <laughs> whether you want good time or bad time. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. and, and your time with yourself. Are you okay with yourself, right? It's it's interesting time. what time with yourself does like you get to really see who you are when you're not busy all the time Mm -hmm. so yeah it's an interesting experience so stay busy well no i think a lot of people (laughs) i think the easiest thing to do when you have when you have real deal stuff you need to take care of and priorities that you need to reorganize i think the easiest thing to do is get super busy oh yeah that's i was being funny yeah yeah totally see them Right, you right. Got to think about it. That's the American way to self improvement. Man, I, I'm not comfortable <laughs> with who I am. I need to get way, way more busy. I need to give me another job. Yep. <laughs> That'll fix it. Then I won't. I won't have the energy to think about it, so it will go away. Uh, so back to our cultural Marxist. I think we're pretty much saying that there isn't one. Let's, well, check this out. Even better. What do you think that uh, the people who are attending these protests, the individuals who are attending these protests, if you met one, how do you think they would prefer to be addressed in the real instance of you meeting one? Hmm. Not in the abstract. I don't think they want to be called a social justice warrior. I don't know. They definitely wouldn't be want to be referred to as a Marxist, would they? I don't think that they would necessarily know exactly what that means. That's and true, so too. Even if they perceived it to be a badge of honor, I think they would only accept it in a kind of a confused way. Only because it came from someone they see as an enemy. Well, so it must be a badge of honor. Well, they're kids, too, so they want validation. So it would depend on the tone. I think that's why the kids wouldn't answer my question about whether or not they'd read the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> Is my tone was like, well, like, yeah, okay, have you actually read the Communist Manifesto? Right. I wasn't inviting them, I wasn't inviting them to talk about it. But I was, I was putting <laughs> it out there, you know. Let me give myself a little credit. <laughs> You open the lines of communication. Yeah, in a in a very you know not the gross graceful way, but anyway, how would they you know talking about them as cultural Marxists or Marxist or social justice warriors or the alt left, which is my favorite term for them? Um, what is that? How is that useful when you actually interact with them as in, individuals? Them, as if you know, there's this mass of kids out there trying to overthrow the world, which was part of the Tom Woods podcast. Um, yeah, we could get into that. But anyway, when you interact with them at indiv- as an individual at the store, you know, when they're bagging your groceries or checking out, checking out your groceries or, you know, at the McDonald's drive through when you're getting the cheapest possible protein on the planet. Um, I'm not sponsored by them yet. They will be sponsors of the show soon. Uh, how do you interact with them? You know, do you have if you have 30 seconds to spare? Peterson talks about this. He's meeting all these people at all these shows. And he only has like 15 to 30 seconds to talk to him. And I got to see him do this. Um, I did not really talk to him because I'd written him a thing. I just handed him a note. And I was like, it's in there. Like, we'll be quick. Um, 
But people would come up, and in like 15 or 20 seconds, they would express, you know, sincere sincere gratitude, which which I – that was something I actually – actually did, uh, which was really nice to do. And then he'll say, how are you doing? How's your life? And they'll say, you know, not great right now, but, you know, it's looking in, in the right direction or whatever. They'll tell him something. They'll tell him one thing that's very significant to them. Mm-hmm. And so they don't need – he's a sincere guy, and and they've they've already met in the idea land in his books – so they don't need to have the small talk to get to the big issues. It's like, bam, how is your life? Here is exactly how my life is in 25 words. And the meaning transfer is intense, man. It was it was intense to be around that because it was people conveying, it was 300 people conveying very deep meaning to somebody who really cared. And uh, there was, I don't know, like weird energy around that. Even in that short time span. Even in that short time span. So you interact with these people as individuals in your daily life. Like, there's no reason, you know, Peterson's good at that because he's a therapist and he's very sincere. But what's a therapist? It's somebody who talks to a lot of people about their lives and listens honestly. So, and a bunch more, right? But if you just listen to people honestly and learn how to do that, there's no reason you can't also have a very profound interaction with somebody in very little time. Like I'm not, I'm not saying that I got that figured out, uh, but I've seen it, and we've all had that experience. You know, you've, you, we've all had that experience where you meet somebody where immediately you just cut all the BS and you're down to business, and it's awesome, right? Right. And yep. and yeah, you know, we're not, it's unreasonable to expect yourself to have that with everyone, but if you at least expose yourself to the possibility of that, um. That's the only way you'll encounter it. It's like stacking the odds in your favor. Right. Hmm. What is the what is the reason we don't? Um I think is that is that individual? I mean, well, there's many, you know. I could talk about the reasons I don't. Mm-hmm. You know, one of them is uh Am I going to have time for this? Like, if they do open up, am I going to have time to listen? And and the truth is sometimes no, right? And yep. so making sure, you know, there's probably a good way to moderate that. Like, if you got 30 seconds and you got to be off, um, you know, be that's a great time to be polite, right? Or to be the best you can be without trying to open up into somebody's life. But if you do have the yep. time, you know, like sometimes I'm in a rush. Like, why am I in a rush? You know, it's 8 p.m. or something, and I'm at the store. Like, what do I have going on? Yeah, I got stuff I want to do when I get home, but would five or ten minutes kill me? Especially if I had a – would I trade being home for five or ten more minutes for a meaningful interaction with somebody? Hell yeah. Right. Right. But I'm not thinking about it that way. I'm thinking, man, I got to get home so I can do all that stuff that's not important. Right. I got to get back and blog about what I'm going to – I got to get back and do the podcast. Got to do the podcast instead of talk about what I should have done just now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then I can do a podcast about how I'm a dick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, that works too, though. Yeah. Got to have all sides. <laughs> Got to have all sides on this thing. Yeah, totally. I tend to get the time thing too, and also a lot of times it, uh, it's pretty simple that it just I don't care. I mean, like a, um, almost a, a burned out don't care. Like, man, I I don't care what you're going through. I'm burned out. Dude. I'm, I'm already burned out with me. <laughs> I got one for you on that. Okay. Okay, so I agree, and I do that all the time, right? And that's that's like if you have a bad day, it's the... If you have a bad day, you want to make sure you deal with that before you're around the people you got to see every day. <laughs> but it's just as important to realize you got to get that out before you're around the people you never see again. Yeah, because they have lives too. But check it out. Um, I've been I've been working on this. I'm again going to say that I'm not I'm not good at it by any means. But I have had it work a couple times. I've managed to do it right maybe three times now after like after like six months of trying or something. Okay, hmm. or four months of trying. Um. 
there's this thing there's this thing called nonviolent communication that this guy Will Rogers came up with. And uh, the details of nonviolent communication are not important in my opinion. But here is the overarching method. The overarching method is to listen. Instead of getting this wrong, I'm going to pull up my notes. It's right here. I have it here because I am organized. Do you mean Will Rogers, the Will Rogers? Uh, it's the psychologist Will Rogers, it's ah. probably, whose name probably isn't Will. Um, let me look this up. Carl Rogers. There you go. Carl Rogers. Mm. Yeah, different than Will Rogers. Will Rogers yeah. is just the first name that came to mind. Okay, Carl Rogers. Um, so Peterson sums this up, okay? He's summing up Carl Rogers here. He says, if you listen to people, they'll tell you the weirdest bloody things so fast that you just cannot believe it. So if you're having a conversation with someone and it's dull, it's because you're stupid. That's why you're not listening to them properly because they are weird. <laughs> and then he says, you have to be oriented properly in order to listen. The orientation has to be, look, what I want out of this conversation is that the place we both end up at is better than the place where we started. That's it. That's what I'm after. If, that's, if you're not after that, then you've got to think, why the hell wouldn't you be after that? What could you possibly be after that would be better than that in a mm -hmm. conversation? You, if you pursue the first, if you pursue ending up in a place that is better than where you both left, you walk away smarter and more well-equipped for the world than you were before you had the conversation. And so does the other person. Every interaction is an opportunity to leave better equipped for the world. Which is weird. So, okay, so the interactions I've had moved into this new neighborhood and like, you know, you can do the, you can do the uh, casual meet the neighbor thing and I've done, I've right. done a lot of that. There are a couple people where it's like, you know what, I have some time. Like, I'm going to talk to this person about their life. And, and man, it works. Like you got some neighbor you've never met before. It's like, hey, you mind if I, you know, come in and we can chat for 10 minutes or something. I'd be interested to hear about who you are and I can tell you who I am. The, uh, absolutely. No one, no one turns you down for that. Or let's say I haven't been turned down for that. And then you get their story. How'd you get to the neighborhood? You know, maybe like, well, I just got married and da, da, da. It's like, well... Tell me about your husband or what your wife or whatever. You know, a lot of the people where I live are, are old, so their spouse is dead. Well, here's who they were. Well, where did you meet him? Well, I met him here. And then they'll just, you, you do like two or three of those questions, and then they're into some story, right? Uh, this woman who lives next to me, she, she got into the story about how her mother died three months after she was born or a month after she was born. And her father left at that point, and so she was orphaned and raised by this other family whose son, their only son, had polio. And so she grew up, you know, she was adopted into this family, but when she was like a month old. So, you know, they became her mom and dad and brother. And, and you know, and he had, she had an older brother with a big age gap who had polio. And then she tells the story about when he died on the night of his birthday party. Um for reasons that no one ever figured out. He just, he went to bed and then he never woke up. Um, and it's like, whoa. And she tells it, you know, and she t talks about how she felt and how she worked through it. And then his mom died later that year on the wedding anniversary, on her wedding anniversary with her husband. Mm. And I mean, who else are you going to be married to? Um, yeah. So then... The, uh, oh no, excuse me, the husband died. Yeah, the husband died. And, um, 
And so then it was just, you know, her mom, her adopted mom, and uh, and her. And it was, it was like, whoa, like your mom died in birth. Your dad left. Then you got adopted into a family whose son died. And then your dad, your adopted dad died. Like before you were, this is when she was like 17 or something. She lost two families before she was 18. Oh. You know? And here she is. Here she is. And she's not playing a violin about it. She's like, yeah, you know, life was hard and you had to deal. Plus, she's from Northern Ireland. So she's talking about the IRA, right? And like, she knows, you know, boys going into the raw and like some of them get blown up and stuff like that. And if you go to, if you go to Belfast, you know, like some of her friends get, get jacked in Belfast. And uh, anyway, it's like, whoa. You've had, I'm not going to complain about my work problems when we talk about life. <laughs> like, yeah, well, let me tell you about my 20s, okay? Even though I'll probably be greeted with much interest. Oh, yeah, so I have, because she's asked. She's like, tell me about what you do, what you, do you know, what you did, where you're from. I tell her, and she's like, oh, that's amazing, you know, I wanted to go to this place, or I've always wondered how that thing worked or you know those are fascinating people that you met or whatever so because she you know she had the life she had and she's just talking about it and i had the life i had and they are radically different they could not be more different and so um i get to learn from her and she gets to learn from me and like the way that she's gone through a life that i view is just brutally tragic is like something i've been able to learn from even Hmm. though we have none of the same background, you know, we're not the same age or, you know, not even remotely the same age from different countries. You know, we don't, we haven't read the same books, don't like the same music, you know, there's just nothing in common and she has so much to teach. Wow. Which she doesn't consider teaching. It's just, we're just talking about our experience. Right. That's been fascinating. that, That is. That was pretty amazing. It's always amazing, too, when you have a story that you think is really uninteresting and the right person hears it and they're like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is. That is. That's a cool thing. Yeah. That's my example of uh, of trying to apply Carl Rogers' listening technique. It, it, the results are just incredible hmm. when I'm able to do it, which is extraordinarily rare. Taking advantage of it when you can. Though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, every journey begins with a single step. Yep. That's pretty cool. Well, should we, uh, I don't know. I don't think we've solved cultural Marxism yet. No, but I think we've neg- we've uh, navigated our way to an actionable solution. Yep. Which is that regardless of whether or not it's real, um, people are talking about it like it's real. Exactly. And so... That's important. That's important. And, um, and it is most likely that the cultural Marxists so-called, who probably don't want to be called that, um, are actually just really scared. And even if they're not, even if they're evil, the way that they should be treated by... The way, the best way to interact with them, let's say that, is to, mm-hmm. is to interact with them with, with kindness and uh, a willingness to listen. Yep. And that's that was the reason why... I sent that video to you or that podcast in the very beginning was I was struck by the, the conversation of, does it really exist? I was like, well, you know, yeah, it does because so many people think it does. 
it's kind of become a reality whether it's a reality or not sure you know so just being factual about it doesn't really solve anything just well you know these kids they they're not really there it's kind of like and i understand why we say it but well the state doesn't really exist true but (laughs) it kind of does it kind of does and i you know i i'm not naive i understand it's individual actors and blah 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 but it it still kind of does exist yeah, so, it's a con- it's a con- it's a word for a concept, right? And the concept yeah. is real. Yep. Yeah. So just trying to, and I'm not saying that that's exactly what Godfrey was trying to do either, but but just trying to stay factual about everything completely and not not think it through all the way just doesn't really solve anything or help anything. Yeah, right. You could summarize. You could you could shorten that whole podcast to like you know, 15 seconds or something, right? Mm -hmm. Group of people, group of people who are making noises with their mouth that we find scary, right? You're going to find Ralph? What is, okay, that's topic. That's the discussion topic. What, what would be the best way to interact with this group of people? And it would be to listen to them and treat them with kindness. Yeah. And then you're done. It doesn't matter what the group is. It could be your friends. Yeah. What's the best way to interact with your friends? Listen to them and treat them with kindness. What's the best way to interact with a social justice warrior? Listen to them and treat them with kindness. Yep. The opposite is the exact way to not have that friend anymore. Yeah. Which is probably the opposite is the exact way to keep the social justice warrior remaining a social justice warrior. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of times we kind of become their self prophecy because we act exactly the way they say we do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Most of the time, they, they also do the same. But we're not uh, we're not without guilt there, so to say. No, no. Plenty to go around. Plenty to go around. Plenty to go around. <laughs> Well, this has been oh, this has been phenomenal. Um, yeah, it's been really fun to play off that other podcast. You know, that was like thirty minutes. We got two and a half hours out of this, of probably much less dense material. But uh, I hope everyone who is listening uh, made it to the end, or I hope that the people who wanted to make it to the end made it to the end. Let's say that, and uh, <laughs> yeah. we'll. Uh, we will be back with more of these as we record them, hopefully at least once a week, maybe twice a week. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, thanks for listening to episode one on cultural Marxism. Is it real or or is it not, and does that matter? <laughs>